Démonstration touchant le mouvement de la lumière trouvé par M. Romer de l'Académie royale des sciences. On December 7, 1676, a Danish astronomer reported a successful proof concerning the movement of light, movement which implies that light has a finite and calculable velocity. This presentation will look at this unexpected discovery. I'd like to begin with a quote from Jean-Étienne Montucle, an 18th century French mathematician and historian. In the opening words of chapter seven of part four, book nine of his massive work on the history of mathematics, Montucle states an important lesson of which all scientists, amateur and professional alike, should take note. Observations carried out over long periods of time and with care tend to the of making apparent totally unexpected phenomena. Often it even happens that these observations lead to a discovery more interesting than that which was originally sought to be obtained thereby. I have agreed with this principle long before I found it articulated by Montucle. I am interested in what I call practical astronomy. Observations I can make, data I can collect, calculations I can perform. For example, by regular observation of the moon, I can detect its libration, the subtle turning and tilting of the moon, which permits us to see nearly 60% of its surface. Montucla continues in chapter seven to narrate one of the most remarkable examples of this principle, Ole Romer's discovery of the propagation of light. So who was Ole Romer? Born in Aarhus, Denmark, in September of 1644, he moved to Copenhagen to attend university in 1662. His mentor at university was Rasmus Bartel, the scientist then responsible for preparing Tycho Brahe's astronomical observations for publication. Consequently, Romer had access to these to aid him in his study of mathematics and astronomy. In 1671, Romer worked with Jean Picard, the French astronomer credited with the first accurate modern measurement of the size of the Earth, within 0.44% of the modern value. Picard and Romer observed about 140 eclipses of Io in 1671. Io is the closest of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. These observations were used to determine the longitudinal difference between Paris and Tycho Brahe's observatory near Copenhagen. Romer began work at the Royal Observatory in Paris under Giovanni Cassini in 1672, the next year, and he continued making observations of the eclipses of Jupiter's moons. Now, aside from his astronomical achievements, which also include the invention of the Alt Azimuth Telescope Mount, Romer also developed the first graduated temperature scale. He created it because he, he was concerned about instrumental accuracy and the effects of ambient temperature on scientific equipment. Romer shared this scale two years before his death with Daniel Fahrenheit in 1708, leading to Fahrenheit's own scale proposed in 1724. Sadly, due to a fire which destroyed the Copenhagen Observatory in 1728, Few of Romer's own works exist today. But let's return to the matter of his discovery of the propagation of light. Um, what was the state of science at the time? Most scientists and philosophers at the time considered light to be infinite in velocity and thus not propagating or moving. There are a few exceptions. From antiquity, we have the Greek Empedocles, who was known to us through Aristotle who disagreed with him on the matter. There were Islamic scholars such as Avicenna and Al-Hazan. Closer to Romer's time, we have Roger Bacon and Isaac Beekman. In 1612, 60 years or so before Romer's discovery, Galileo had determined the orbital period of the four major moons of Jupiter, and he realized that their eclipses could be used as a timepiece since unlike most other celestial observations, the timing of the eclipses does not depend on one's position on Earth. Thus, the eclipses could be used to synchronize clocks in two locations. Then, two observers compared the differences in time elapsed 
between the eclipse and the observation of, for example, a stellar culmination, when the star passes the observer's meridian, or in other words, when the star reaches its highest point in the sky. This was how the longitude of Tycho Brahe's observatory was determined. In 1619, Johannes Kepler articulated his third law of planetary motion, relating the square of a planet's orbital radius to the cube of its orbital period. Thus, Jupiter's relative distance from the sun was known by its orbital period of nearly 12 Earth years. A period of 12 years implies a mean distance of about 5.2 astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the mean distance between the Earth and the sun. Thus, the scale of the solar system was known. In 1670, only a few years before Romer made his discovery, Cassini in Paris and Jean Richet off the coast of French Guiana in South America measured the astronomical unit in miles by computing the parallax of Mars. Now, the scale and the size of the solar system were known. They made this measurement using the orbits of Jupiter's moons first to synchronize their clocks, ensuring that they made their measurements simultaneously. They came out with a figure of around 87 million miles, which is about 6 million miles short of today's accepted value. Oddly enough, 14 years earlier, Christian Huygens measured the astronomical unit via angles with Venus and erred by almost the same amount on the plus side. His value was about 99 million miles. So we have 87 million miles and 99 million miles, and in between we have 93 million miles, which is approximately the value of the astronomical unit today. All of this now brings us back to the Google Doodle. On December 7th, 2016, the 340th anniversary of Romer's announcement in the Journal de Savant, Google displayed this doodle on their homepage. Romer observes, then ponders, and waits to observe again. Nearby, a pendulum keeps time. The apparatus you see is his telescope on an alt azimuth mount of his own design. And the OO in Google depicts Romer's diagram from his report in the journal. Now, if you're wondering why you don't recall seeing this particular Google Doodle, that's because it wasn't displayed in the United States. So how did Romer make his determination that light has a finite speed? Romer had collected eight years worth of timing of Eos eclipses. Shown here is a facsimile of one of his sets of records. An average period between eclipses had been determined to be 42 minutes, 27 seconds, uh, 42 hours, 27 minutes, and 33 seconds. But Romer found that over long periods of observation, the eclipses fell out of sync with their expected times. And he knew that Earth's distance from Jupiter, being what it was, should have no impact on the actual period of Io's orbit. But if light, like sound, takes time to propagate, then an observer's distance from a source of light would affect the time it took for the light to reach them. Now, the variances in time that Romer found were most pronounced around the times of Jupiter's quadrature, when the angle between the Sun and Jupiter, with Earth in the middle, is around 90 degrees, as this model here will demonstrate. The red vector represents Earth's instantaneous velocity, while the green vector represents the component of that vector in the direction of Jupiter. Now, the periods near quadrature naturally produce the greatest variance between the expected and the observed times of the eclipse, because then the vector of Earth's velocity, the red vector, is directly collinear with a line joining Earth and Jupiter. So here we see, as quadrature approaches, the green and red vectors are aligned. What this means is that during the times of quadrature, all of the Earth's velocity is being used to move towards or away from Jupiter, whereas the moment we just passed, very little of Earth's velocity was being used to bring it away from Jupiter. And so here we see again that the other quadrature, the same phenomena repeats itself.
Romer made a prediction in September of 1676 that the November 9 emergence of Io would occur 10 minutes later than the standard timetable calculated. Sure enough, Io emerged at 5.35 and 45 seconds on November 9, 1676, in Paris, 10 minutes later than expected. The timetables had been drafted three months earlier in August, when Earth was much closer to Jupiter. Earth had since moved a quarter of the way through its orbit further away from Jupiter. Rumor provided the following diagram in his report to the Royal Academy. The Sun and Jupiter are denoted by A and B. Jupiter's shadow is marked above it. Io's orbit is the circle around B. Io enters Jupiter's shadow, called an immersion, at point C. Io exits Jupiter's shadow, called an emergence, at point D. It is important not to confuse these true eclipses of Io by Jupiter's shadow with occultations of Io by Jupiter itself. An observer on Earth can never see Io both enter and exit Jupiter's shadow. Either its immersion or emergence will be obscured by the disk of Jupiter. The remaining points, E through K, represent Earth at points along its orbit. E represents Earth with Jupiter at conjunction. H represents Earth with Jupiter at opposition. F and G signify two observations of immersions of Io into Jupiter's shadow as Earth is approaching Jupiter. L and K signify two observations of emergences of Io from Jupiter's shadow as Earth retreats from Jupiter. Combining his data with this diagram, rumor detected that the eclipses happen sooner than expected as Earth moves from F to G and later than expected as Earth moves from L to K. This was, in effect, an observation of the Doppler effect nearly two centuries before it was proposed by Christian Doppler in 1842. By comparing the time differences over long periods of observation, Romer calculated that light travels the distance EH, twice the distance from the Earth to the Sun, or two astronomical units, in about 22 minutes. While he didn't explicitly calculate the speed of light, Romer presented all the data and all the variables necessary for its computation. Christian Huygens used Romer's data to arrive at a speed of 220,000 kilometers per second, off by about 25% of the modern 300,000 kilometers per second. In 1809, using more accurate timing, this value was calculated to within less than 1% of the modern value. And so it was that by making careful observations of Io's eclipses for the purposes of establishing longitude, Ole Romer revealed evidence for a groundbreaking discovery about light, a discovery more interesting than that which was originally sought. To use those words often attributed to Galileo, si muove, it moves. Thank you.